from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2021 virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon 21, CloudNativeCon 21 virtual. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here with a great guest to break down one of the hottest trends going on in the industry and certainly around cloud native as this new modern architecture is evolving so fast. Richard Hartman, director of community at Grafana Labs, involved with Prometheus as well. Um, expert and uh, fun to have on and also is going to share a lot here. Richard, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You know, we were chatting before we came on camera about <laughs> the human's ability to, to handle all this new shift uh, and, the, and the future of observability is what everyone has been talking about. But, you know, some say, oh, observability is just network management which is different, you know, scale. Okay, I can buy that, but it's got a lot more than that. It involves data, it involves a new architecture, new levels of scale that cloud native has brought to the table that everyone is agreeing on. It scales there, new capabilities, thus setting up new architectures, new expectations, and new experiences are all happening. Take us through the future of observability. Yeah, so um, one one of the things which many people find when they onboard themselves onto the cloud native space is um, you can scale along different and new axes which you couldn't scale along before, uh, which is great. Of course, it enables growth. It enables uh, different uh, operating models. It enables you to choose different or more modern engineering trade-offs. Like the underlying problems are still the same, but you just slice and dice your problems and uh, compartmentalize your services differently. But the problem is um, it becomes more spread out. And the more classic tooling uh, tends to be built for those more classic um, setups and architectures. As your architecture becomes more malleable and as you can, can choose and pick how to grow it along with which axes a lot more directly and you have to, um, that limits the ability of the humans actually operating that system to understand what is truly going on. Um, obviously, everyone is is full, fully all in on AI, ML, and all those things. But one of the dirty secrets is uh, you will keep needing domain-specific experts who know what they are doing and what that thing should look like, what should be working, how it should be working. But enable those people to actually to actually understand the current state of the system and compare this to the desired state of the system is highly non-trivial, in particular once you have not machine lifetimes of months or years, which you had before, um, which came down to, to sometimes hours, and when you go to to, micro, uh, to, to serverless and such, uh, sometimes even into sub-seconds. So a lot of this is about um, enabling this, this, this higher volume of data, this higher scale of data, this higher cardinality of what uh, what you actually attach as metadata on your data, and then still be able to query all this and make sense of it at scale and at speed. Because if you just toss it into a data lake and do batch analysis like half a day later, no one cares about it anymore. It needs to be live. It needs, or at least the largest part of it needs to be live. You need to be able to alert right now if something is imminently customer facing. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I love, totally agree this new observability, horizontally scalable, more surface area, more axes, as you point out, changes the data equation. Obviously automation plays a big role. You mentioned machine learning and AI, great, great grounds for that. I got to ask you just well, before we move on to the next topic around this is that the most people that come from the old world with the tooling and come from that old school vendor mentality or old suit architecture, old school architecture, tend to kind of throw stones at the future and say, well, the economics are all wrong and the performance metrics. So, so I want to ask you, so for, assume that we believe, we do believe you, because assume that's going to happen. What is the economic picture? What's the impact that people are missing? When you look at the benefits of what this system is going to enable, the impact specifically, whether it's economics, productivity, efficient code, what are some of the things that maybe the VCs or other people on the naysayer side, old school will, will throw stones at? What's the, what's the big upside here? So this will not be true for everyone and there will still be certain situations where it makes sense to, to, to choose different uh, sets of, of trade-offs, but most everyone will be moving into the cloud for, for convenience and speed reasons. And I'm deliberately not saying cost reasons. 
Um, the reason being, um, usually or in the past, you had simply different standard service delineations and all of the ProServe, the consulting, your hiring pool was all aligned with this old type of service delineation, which used to be a physical machine or a service, or maybe even a service and you had a hot standby or something, if we, if we go like really a few years back. Um, the same things still need to operate underlaying what you do, but as we grow as an industry, more of more of this is commoditized and same as we commoditize servers and storage and network we commoditize the actual running of that machine and with serverless and such, such go even further um, so it's not so much about about this fundamentally changing how it's built it's just that a larger or a previously thing which was part of your value add and of what you did in your core is now just off the shelf infrastructure which you just buy as much as you need it Again, at certain scales and for certain specific use cases, this will not be true for the foreseeable future. Um, but most everyone um, will be moving there simply because where they actually add value and the people they can hire for, uh, for and who are interested in that type of problem uh, just mean that it's a lot more more sensical to, to choose this different delineation, but it's not cheaper. Yeah, and, and the commoditization and disintermediation is definitely happening, totally agree. And the complexity that's going to be abstracted away with software is novel and it's also systematic. It's, it's, just, it's new and there's some systems involved. So great insight there, I totally agree with you. The disruption is happening majority of almost all areas. So in all verticals and in all industries, so, so great point. I think this is where I think everyone's so excited and some people are paranoid actually, frankly, we, but we cover that in depth on theCUBE and other segments, but great point. Well, we'll get back to what you're, where you're spending your time right now. Um, you're spending a lot of time on open metrics. Uh, what is that enabling? Take, take us through that. So, um, the super quick history of Prometheus, of course we need that for open metrics. Uh, Prometheus was actually created in 2012 um, and the wire format which you used to and the, the exposition format which you used to transport metrics into uh, Prometheus is stable since 2014. Um, but there is a large problem here. Um, it carries the Prometheus name and a lot of competing projects and a lot of competing vendors, of course there are vendors which compete with just the project, um, simply refused to, to, to to take anything in which carried the Prometheus name. Of course, this doesn't align with their FUD um, strategy, which they ran back then. So um, together with CNCF, we decided to just have a new different name for just that wire format, for the underlying data model, uh, for everything which you need to make one complete exposition or a bunch of expositions towards, uh, towards um, Prometheus. So that's it at the core. And that's been ongoing since 2015, 16 something. Um, but there's also changes. Uh, on the one hand, there is a super careful, a super, super careful um, cleanup and backwards compatible cleanup of, of a few things which the Prometheus exposition format series here for didn't get right. Um, but also we enable new features um, within this. And as Prometheus chose open metrics as its official format, we also uplift Prometheus. And wearing both hats, obviously it's easier to get the synchronization. Um, Exemplars stand out, which is a completely new, at least outside of certain large search companies, Google, um, who uh, who use the, who use exemplars to do something different with with their traces. Um, it was in 2017 uh, when they told me that for them searching for traces didn't scale by labels. Uh, and at that point, I wanted to have both, uh, I wanted to have traces and logs also with the same label set as Prometheus has them. But when they tell you searching doesn't scale, um, like when they tell you, you better listen. So um, the thing is this, you have your index where you store all your data or your, where you have the reference to into your database and you have these label sets and they are super efficient and, and quite powerful when compared to more traditional systems, but they still carry a cost and that cost becomes non-trivial at scale. So um, instead of storing the same labels for your metrics and your logs and your traces, the idea is uh, to just store an ID for your trace which is super lightweight and it's literally just one ID. So your index is super tiny 
Um, and then you attach this information to your logs, uh, to your metrics, and in the meantime, also to your to your logs. Um, so you know already that trace has certain properties. Of course, historically, you have this needle and haystack problem. You have endless amounts of traces, and you need to figure out what are they useful? Are they are they do they show an interesting error state, high latency, some error occurring, whatever? If that information is already attached to your other signals. That's a lot easier because you see your high latency bucket and you see a trace ID, which is for that high latency bucket. So going into that trace, I already know it is a high latency uh, trace for, for a service which has a high latency. It has this and that uh, label. It was run in this and that context, blah, 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 blah. Same for logs. There is an error. There is an exception, maybe a security breach, what have you. And I can jump directly into a trace and I have all this mental context. And the most expensive part is the human. So enabling that human to not need to, to break mental uh, train of thought, to just jump directly from all the established state, which they already have during debugging, just right into the trace and back, and just see why that thing behaves that way. It's super powerful. And it's, it's also a lot cheaper to store this on the back end for your traces, which in our case, internally, we just run it 100% sampling. We do not throw data away, which means you don't have the super interesting thing. And oh, by the way, the trace just doesn't exist because it got dropped. And that's the one thing to, to from day one, this uh, intent to, to marry those three uh, pillars more closely. The other thing is by having a true lingua franca, it, it gave that concept of, of, of Prometheus compatibility on the wire its own name and its, its own distinct concept. And that is something which a lot of people simply attached to. So just by having that name allowed a completely different uh, conversation over the last half decade or so. And How is to it close that, Okay, go ahead, finish. Yeah. Close it up. And to close that point, because I come from the network uh, from the networking space, and and basically IETF RFCs are, are the the currency within the networking space, and how you force your vendors to support something, which is why I brought open metrics into the IETF uh, to to give it an official stamp of approval and RFC number, which is currently hopefully successful. Um, so all of a sudden you can slip this into your tender and just tell your vendor X, Y, Z, okay, you need to support this and that RFC and all of a sudden by contract they're bound to, to support Prometheus natively. So has the IT, IETF support that RFC yet or is no, is that still coming? I, so at the last uh, IETF meeting, which was virtual obviously, um, I presented everything to the Ops AWG um, and there was very good feedback. Um, they want to adopt it as an uh, informational uh, ID. Reason being, it it is most or it is a documentation of an already widely existed standard, so it gets different bits and pieces in the header. Um, currently, I'm I'm waiting for a few uh, rounds of feedback on specific wording, how to make it more clear and such. Um, but looking but the, good, it's looking good. So, oh yes, they uh, while presenting it, they actually <laughs> told me that they ran. <laughs> IETF, the conference with Prometheus and Grafana, so. Well, that's how you get <laughs> things done in the old school internet. That's the way it was. I mean, I you know, talking to Vince Cerf and all the, my friends in that uh, generation, we grew up. I mean, I was telling a story on a clubhouse, just random, that I grew up in the era we used to pirate software. We used to, we used to steal software back in the old days, pre-open source. This is how things get done. So I got to ask you the impact question. The, the, the deal with open metrics potentially could disrupt all those startups. So. What, how does this impact all these stars? Because everyone's jockeying for land grabbing the observability space. Is that just because it's just too many people competing for one spot or do they all have differentiation? What happens to all those observability startups that got minted and funded? So I, I have, to, I think we have to split this into two answers. Uh, the first one, uh, open metrics and also Prometheus, um, we are trying really hard to standardize what we are doing and to make this reusable as much as we possibly can. Um, simply because Prometheus itself does not have any, any profit motivation or anything. It is just a project run by people. Um, so we gain by, by users using our stuff and working in the way which we think is, is a good way to operate. 
So anyone who just supports all those open standards just onboards themselves onto a huge ecosystem of already installed base. And we are talking millions and millions and millions of installations. We don't have hard numbers, but the millions and millions I am certain of. Uh, and that's installations, not users. So that's several orders of magnitude more. Um, so that, that actually enables an ecosystem within which to move. As to the second question, it is a super hot topic. So obviously the VC money starts coming in from all sides. Um, I don't think that everyone will survive, but that is just how it usually is. Yeah. There is a lot of, of not very differentiated uh, offerings, be they software, be they as a service, be they distributions, where you don't really see much much value at not not a lot of not a lot of much anything in ways of innovation. So this is more about about uh, making it easier to run or, or taking that pain away, which obviously makes you open to attack by by all the hyperscalers. Of course, yeah. they can just do this at a higher scale yeah. than you. Um, so unless you actually really innovate in that space and actually shape and lead in that space, at least to some extent, it will probably be relatively hard. You know, that being said, yeah, when you ride the, when you ride the big waves like this, I mean, you, you got to be on the right side of this. Uh, Pat Gelsinger, when he was at VMware, now he's at Intel, told me on the Cube one time, if you're not, you don't get it right on these waves, you're driftwood, right? So, so you know, and we've seen this movie before. When you start to see the standards bodies like the IETF start to look at standards, you start to think there's a broader market opportunity, there's a need for some standards, which is good, it enables uh, more value, right? Value creation, whether it's out in the open or if it's innovative from a commercialization standpoint, you know, these are good things. And then you have everyone who's jockeying around for the land grab, in comes a standard momentum. You got to be on the right side of these things. <laughs> we know what the, we know it's going to look like if you're not on the right side of a standard, then you're proprietary. Precisely. Okay. And so that's the end game. Okay. Well, I really appreciate the impact. Final question. Um, as the world evolves post COVID, as cloud native goes mainstream, the enterprises in the cloud scale are demanding more things. Enterprises are, are, you know, they want more stuff than just straight up born in the cloud startups, for instance. So you start to see, you know, faster, more agility, obviously uh, with deploying modern apps. But when you start getting into enterprise grade scale, you got to start thinking, you know, this is an engineering and computer science discipline coming together, you got to look at the architecture. What's your uh, future vision of how the next gen programmable infrastructure looks like? You mean as in actually manage those services or limited to observability? Uh, observability, the role of observability, just in, you're in the, you're in the observability speaks to the operating system of what's going on, distributed computing. You're looking at, you got to have a good observability if you want to deploy <laughs> services. So, you know, as it evolves, and this is not a fringe thing anymore, this is real deal. This observability is a key linchpin in the architecture. So um, maybe to approach this from two sides, uh, one of the things which, which, I mean, I come from very much non-cloud native background. One of the things which tends to be overlooked in, in cloud native is that not everything is greenfield. Matter of fact, um, legacy is the code word for makes actual money. Um, so um, a lot of brownfield installations which still make money and will, which will keep making money. And all of those exist and they will not go away anytime soon. And as soon as you go to actual industry, trying to uplift themselves to industry that foreign, all those buzzwords, you get a lot more complexity in, in just the availability of systems than just the cloud native scale. So um, being able to, to actually put all of those data types together and not just have your, okay, nice, I have my microservice and it's fully instrumented. And if anything happens on the layer below, I'm simply unable to, to make any, any effort on debugging. Um, things like, for example, Prometheus course, they are so widely adopted and able to literally, and I did this myself, um, from the diesel genset of your data center over the network down to down to uh, the office if if someone is in there if 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 your station and your pager is is uh, is, uh, is theft and such to the database to the actual service which is facing your end customers all of those 
use the same label sets, use the same metadata to actually talk about this. So all of a sudden, I can really drill down into my data, not only from, yeah, okay, I have my microservices, and I have my database, big deal. No, I can actually go down as deep in my infrastructure as my infrastructure is. And this is especially important for anyone who's from the more traditional enterprise. Of course, most of them will, for the foreseeable future, have tons and tons and tons of those installations. And the ability to just marry all this data together, no matter where it's coming from, um, of course, you have this lingua franca and you have these widely adopted open standards. I right. think that is one of the main drivers. You in, nailed, in the I think future. you just nailed the hybrid <laughs> enterprise use case, you know, operation at scale and integrating of systems. So great job, Richard. Thank you so much for coming on. Richard Hartman, Director of Community at Grafana Labs. Uh, I'm talking observability here on theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, your host, covering KubeCon 21, Cloud Native Con 21 virtual. Thanks for watching.